So we are just gonna go ahead through and basically cover everything that we did this semester to review then for the final. Um, so we'll do some questions throughout, like as we go through the different um, topics and whatnot, so we can just answer those throughout. Um, so remember, initially we started talking about different types of variables in terms of uh, what, how they relate to each other. So we have our explanatory and our response variables. The explanatory variables are independent and they explain the differences in the response variable. So the response variable is dependent upon that explanatory variable. That means that if something changes in the response, um, in the explanatory variable, then the response variable will also change. Um, uh, but the opposite, since the explanatory variable is independent, um, something changes in the response, that's not gonna affect the explanatory variable. Um, and then a few things to keep in mind with uh, confounding variables and then treatments. Um, all that is is just talking about, uh, we wanna remember that if we have a confounding variable that can uh, really skew our data to a point that it's not uh, giving us results that are representative um, and may give us things that we think are true but they're not necessarily um, the correct uh, interpretation of the data. Um, it's like a third variable that kind of impacts whatever we're looking at. Um, and it's kind of giving us a measure that we weren't looking at measuring in the first place. And then um, we'll actually talk about treatment. Treatment goes involved with that because it's also something that impacts your um, variables, but we'll talk about that when we talk about different types of studies. So uh, let's just finish up about variables. So um, another way to categorize var variables is you have uh, categorical or quantitative variables. So categorical, remember are those labels or groups, so colors, flavors, uh, brands of clothing or cars or types of something, uh, you know, types of material maybe. And then you have uh, nominal and ordinal. Nominal means there's no apparent uh, order to them. Ordinal means that there is some sort of hierarchy. So an example of a nominal variable would be um, like types of material. So like, you know, linoleum is not above um, wood or is it? But in the idea of a nominal variable, it's not. So then we have ordinal variables. Um, so an ordinal categorical variable would be something like class standing, um, or like, you know, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Um, like in the Olympics, like the uh, bronze, silver, gold, that's an ordinal categorical variable because they're not numbers, but they are, they do have a specific order to them in a hierarchy. Um, and then we have quantitative variables. So these ones have numbers attached to them. So they're either discrete or continuous. Uh, so discrete are gonna be those that uh, take on a certain value. They can't, um, it can't be any value in between that max and the min. They do have to take on a certain value. So um, a lot of these are things like if you have uh, whole numbers, it has to be a whole number, like for example, like people, um, that would be a quantitative, uh, a discrete quantitative variable. Um, and continuous means it can take on any value in between that max and min. Um, anything that can be split up, decimals, so like any type of measurement in terms of like uh, weight or height, you know, centimeters, inches, pounds, those would be continuous. Okay, and like I said before, we have our two different types of uh, studies. We have our experimental, where the researcher puts some sort of manipulation to it, and then the observational, where there's no manipulation. Um, observational, I say it's people watching, you're just kind of checking out what's going on, taking data on it. Um, the only difference between that and experimental, you're still looking at your you know, subjects and taking data on it, but you're imposing some sort of manipulation to see if that manipulation has um, an impact or a specific type of impact on them. It's also called a scientific study, um, and this is where the whole treatment idea comes in because we are going to impose a treatment upon them to um, see if it changes there. So those are the two different types of studies that we do. So let's try this question here. So in a survey of military veterans, the variable branch of service um, between Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, et cetera, is what? So which type of variable do we think that this one is? Yay, good job. Yeah, so where's my little pen? Yes, so our answer here is going to be A. Found my pen. So um, if we're looking at this in terms of uh, we want to, what I always check first is um, what type of variable it is. In this case, you know, it kind of, we would have ended up 
we don't really have to go much further, but we know it is a categorical variable because these are different categories. Um, if we were to go in terms of, um, you know, breaking down a little bit more, this would uh, be a nominal um, because there's no hierarchy to it. I'm sure there's actually someone thinks there, there is or whatever. I'm not sure. I'm not very well versed in that stuff. But um, for purposes of this, there's no order to this. They can basically, you can put them in any order. Um, so that's another way to look at it too. But it's neither of these, obviously, because it is not quantitative. So good job, our answer is A. All right. So we have reliability. And reliability is just talking about um, consistency. And it's just saying that if you were to do um, a study, you will want to get the same results over and over and over again, because that's showing that it's reliable. It shows that your sample is, um, you know, giving you reliable results because it's consistent. Um, and if you have a small sample size, you're going to get low reliability, which means it's probably going to be more variable. Um, so that's why we always talk about you want to have that large sample size in order for it to be representative of that population there. Um, and your margin of error is going to be 1 divided by square root of n. So that's going to have the inverse relationship with sample size. Um, and so as that's just given the fact that 1 divided by anything, um, whatever's in the denominator, that's going to be the in, um, what there's an inverse relationship of because you're flipping it. It's like the reciprocal. Um, so that's just something else that we use when we're talking about reliability. That's why I have it on this slide. So. Um, and then just keep in mind the interpretation of the margin of error. It's the difference between the sample percent and the true population. They're saying that that's going to be within the margin of error at at least 95% of the time. So it's the margin of error is kind of showing us, it's kind of like our wiggle room, like where we're like, okay, it's going to be in here. Um, this is kind of the area that we're giving it uh, for 95% of the time. So it's because we always know that obviously in statistics, things are not always so consistent that, you know, and we can't make conclusions that are so causal and you know so uh, strict and everything so that's the idea there okay so let's try this one so a random sample of 1,000 residents of montana a population of 1 million is taken to estimate the percentage of adults in that state who do not have cell phone service a similar survey of 1,000 adult residents is conducted using the same methodology in california which has a population of 39 million so comparing the two um polls what would we find so this seems to be a tricky question, um, so that's why I want to use it. So let me know what you guys think the answer is for this, and we'll re review it then together. Okay, cool. So let's review this one. So when we remember our margin of error, it's going to have that, um, it depends on sample size. Um, okay, like in, in general, does it depend on our sample size? Um, but the size of the population doesn't necessarily matter. So um, remember, so our margin of error does have that, um, that inverse relationship with sample size. So for example, if this goes up, that means that we had a smaller margin of error, okay? Um, so it's one thing to keep in mind. So A is saying the margin of error for the California poll will be greater than the error for the Montana poll. So the California poll has the 39 million 
population, the Montana poll has the 1 million. Um, so this isn't the answer because um, if we have a larger sample size, um, or just in general, this doesn't really make sense just because of the fact that we don't, um, it doesn't really matter about the population, but this is basically saying that, oh, there's a larger population, so the margin of error would be greater, which isn't true. Um, and then B is saying the margin of error for the Cali California poll would be less. Um, and that's saying that's saying the same thing, except it's still just looking at the population. So we can't do that one. This is talking about the margin of error. This has, um, and remember, N is going to be our sample size. Um, so we're not talking about the population. We're talking about the sample size. So the margin of error for the California poll would be about the same. We're going to have to go to C here, just given the fact that um, a random sample is taken from each of them, and it's taking a thousand residents from each of them. So we're assuming that if um, the sample is the same for each of them in this case, so our, let's say that our N1 is going to be Montana, and then um, our N2 is going to be California. This means that, so our N1 and our N2 are going to be the same thing because they're both a thousand. So in this case, it's going to be, yeah, so then it's going to be um, our margin of error is going to be approximately the same for both of them because N1 and N2 um, are the same. So that's where I answer C. So good. All right. Okay, so these are just the different uh, sampling methods that um, I know are a little bit tricky. Um, I'll go over the simple random, the, some of the ones that are a bit quicker that most people understand. So simple random sampling is basically what we've been doing the entire semester in terms of it's, if it says like, oh, random sample has been taken of blah, 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 like that's going to be a simple random sample. Um, but then we have uh, stratified and cluster sampling, which I'm going to skip because we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, systematic is, all that one is is saying like you take, there's like some sort of system or rule that you're using. So um, you take every nth person in the class and then take a sample from them, you know, or, you know, in a deck of cards, you take every fifth card and that's going to be like the deck that you use or something like that. And then multi-stage is the only thing that that is, is basically a combination of the different ones that we had just listed above. Um, okay, so stratified sampling. So that's basically when you take the population and you split it into groups. But the way you split it into groups is that it's based on a factor that could influence the variable that you're being met, that's being measured. So you want to, it's basically kind of like putting away, you don't want any confounding variables type thing. So um, that's, so you're going to put it into a group that kind of like takes that away. So for example, if you had, um, you know, po populations that had really uh, different variable, like po population sizes, um, Instead, what you would want to do when you're taking those samples, maybe you want to um, partition each population into taking like a sample of like 50% of each of them or something that gives, you know, a, a, an amount that shows, you know, this is like the amount we're trying to take from that population. And this is so, you know, it wouldn't be one population wouldn't look different because it's bigger than the other one. Um, it would basically be like, okay, we're taking this amount from each one. So that's going to be equal when you do it in relation to one another. So. Uh, that'll keep from bias and everything and that's making groups that are different be to be more similar um, so like I said you know if they have different populations you're making them more similar by uh, making those populations similar by um, changing the sample size taking a sim like a, a proportion of each of them whatever um, as long as it's the same there so the way we describe stratifies we're um, dividing homogeneous strata so those are like your um, the different strata that you take, so those are the ones that they're gonna have the same in each, um, and then take a simple random sample from each, and then that's, um, and then take all these samples to create your sample. So then basically you have a little representative piece of each population in there. You don't have too much of one, too much of another. They're all being represented in that population or in that sample that you got, and then that's gonna be your new sample. So it's as if you were to take like a simple random sample of the entire thing, but instead of, you know, having the possibility of taking like, a round sample of 500, but you have a population of two and a population of like a thousand, you're probably gonna get a bunch from a thousand, you know, it's something like that. Um, so that's how you're gonna do that one. Cluster sampling is different that um, you're going to have, you're still dividing into groups, but the groups are gonna be um, clustered depending on you, that you want them to be more similar. 
Um, so you want them to be into header, or excuse me, they're gonna be similar, but you want them to be more um, randomized clusters. So that's the difference here. Um, so then at this point, you're allowed to, you don't have to combine them all at the end because you're gonna take different clusters out of the um, population. And each of those clusters are gonna be um, like a mix. They're gonna be representative. They're gonna be heterogeneous. And then after you take those simple random samples, then you can use each of those samples as like each of your samples that you had um, since they're already different from one another. So those ones are tough, I understand. Um, but just try to, the best thing to do for those I think is to do practice problems. Um, that's usually helped me the most to understand them because it kind of shows you, you know, in real life what it is because statistics does happen in real life, believe it or not, so. Okay, let's try this one. So, true, false, since the nature of the population does not matter, the sampling distribution of the sample proportion will approximately follow the normal distribution, even for a convenient sample. So this is kind of uh, teasing, we're gonna start talking about uh, normal distributions. So let me know if you think this one is true or false. Okay, so if we go through this, so since the nature of the, of the oh, let me get my thing. Since the nature of the population doesn't matter, the sampling distribution um, of a sample proportion will approximately formal the normal distribution even for a convenient sample. So let's remember what a convenient sample is. So our convenient sample is just taking like whatever is easiest. Um, so whatever we have available to us. Um, so the issue here is saying that, you know, we, when we have a convenient sample, there's no telling um, if that's gonna be representative of our population or not, because you're taking what you have available to you. So if you're trying to figure out, you know, something about all Penn State students, but, <laughs> excuse me, but you take <laughs> an example of, or like you take different sample, a sample of like everyone just in your class at that moment, that's gonna be, you know, probably not representative of all Penn State students. So that's a convenient sample. So we can't necessarily assume that it's gonna follow a normal approximation for a convenient sample. So it's gonna be false for this one, but um, the idea um, of it following a normal um, distribution is true in terms of the fact that like, even if it was, as long as you take like a large enough sample size, even if it's skewed, that's something that um, you might've been thinking about too, but, um, but yeah, you want to make sure that your sampling distribution um, is going to come from a randomized sample with a large enough sample in order for it to follow that normal approximation. But other than that, um, but we do want to keep in mind that when we have these convenient samples or like um, voluntary, um, voluntary samples, those are going to be ones that aren't always going to be um, true. You know, we can't always assume that that's going to be a normal uh, distribution. So does that make sense? Cool. All right. All right, so let's just review quickly some measurement data displays. Um, I won't go too in depth. I think we understand these pretty well. So we just have our histograms and dot plots just showing the frequency of uh, quantitative variables. So here on our x-axis, we're showing the frequency of an age. Um, and the dot plot is very uh, generic, telling us that we're showing the frequency of a value. So uh, that's all it is, just talking about quantitative data. So do keep that in mind that measurement data displays, we talked about quantitative. Um, and then if we go to here, this is um, talking about uh, the different SKUs of our data. So if we were to, because um, we always talk about our sampling distributions and you know what the shape of them is. So here's our example of having um, symmetrical data. So this is saying that our mean is equal to our median, which is equal to our mode, which are all gonna be the center line here. The difference here in a left skew, beautiful, um, our mean is gonna be down here, our median's gonna be in the middle always, and then our mode's gonna be, because that's the most commonly occurring, so that'll be the highest point, that'll be the mode. So that'll be a left skew, 
And then the opposite goes for a right skew. Well, that's not right skewed at all. Um, something like that. Our mean is gonna be the greatest because that's where the spread is. The median, like I said, is always the middle. And then our mode, most commonly occurring, is gonna be on the left side there. So those are just different um, distributions that you'll see the data represented in. Um, so yeah, and then here's more measurement data displays. Remember, these are for quantitative. So we have our box plot and our side-by-side -side box plots. Remember, um, for box plots, this is where it's really good at showing us the quartiles. Um, so if we're looking down here and we have our minimum down here, and this is our maximum, we do have our Q1 here, our Q2, which is also our median, I guess we can put it over here, Q2, and then Q3. This is our IQR. Um, or interquartile range, and it's also the middle 50% of the data um, between those. Um, so that's just a different way, and if I'll write it down here just because that's kind of messy, but um, that's just a box plot's a good way to use um, to interpret quartile data. So we have our minimum and our maximum, which are technically at the 100th, and then the zeroth, you can say, percentile. Um, and then we're going to have our Q1, Q2, Q3. Remember, this is our median. This is in the 25th percentile. This is in the 50th, and this is in the 75th. So remember, percentile is just talking about what percent of the data lies at or below that point. So for Q1, that means that 25% of the data lies at or below um, Q1. So this is 25% of our data. Um, yeah, so 25. That's where we get the 25th percentile. So in side-by-side -side box plots, the only difference there is that we add in a categorical variable um, to compare them in terms of that. So this is a good way to compare medians and, you know, obviously like maximums and minimums. Um, it's just a good comparing method if you are looking at those different measurements. All right, so let's talk about like what different types of uh, graphs we would use. So the director of admissions in a small college administered from newly designed entrance tests to 100 students selected at random from the upcoming freshman class. The purpose of the study was to determine whether students grade point average at the end of freshman year can be predicted from the entrance test score. At the end of the year when all the data are available, what would the graph, um, what graph should you use to display the data? So read through these options and let me know in terms of the question which one you think we want to use. Okay, good. So yeah, we're definitely going to want to use a scatter plot here because we are trying to find, um, it looks like they're trying to find a, like a correlation between these. So the grade point average and then um, the entrance test score. So, but we do want to make sure that we remember that our explanatory variable, um, so, so we know it's not A or B because that's not what we're looking for. Um, so we do want it to be a scatter plot. Um, but we want to find that your explanatory variables on the x-axis. So I always remember because like x explanatory. Um, so our explanatory variable on the x-axis. Oops, not sure what I did there. Um, and then our response variable on the y-axis. So in this case, we want to keep in mind. So what were we talking about? We were talking about, um, this is, they're looking for test scores in the um, GPA. So they're trying to see if the grade point average is can be predicted from the entrance test scores. So remember, our entrance test score is what's going to be, that's what we're trying to see is that predicts the GPA. So this is the entrance scores, because um, this is like before they're saying if these entrance scores are going to predict the GPA 
Okay, so GPA is a response variable because it's being affected by the entrance scores. And then you're going to see your scatter plot like this. So our answer is actually going to be C, just because we want to have our GPA on the y axis because that's going to be a response variable. And then our entrance score is going to be the explanatory. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Okay, standard scores, all this is is talking about um, taking when you have you know a bunch of different data taking that and moving from a um taking you know your random data and moving it to a standardized scale so this is how and then you can compare it to other data even if it was on a different scale so um here this shows you just the equation you'll also see it written um you know we call our standardized score the z score so you also see it written as um you know x minus x bar so the value minus the mean over the standard deviation. Um, so that's always, that's another way you can see a rim, but this is the equation. So, you know, let's say you had two different graphs here. And let's say this is gonna be the one with the standard scores on it. I wanna standardize maybe a mean of five, and then I wanna standardize this value over here of, let's say this is one standard deviation away, and this value is gonna be um, seven. If I were to standardize that, our mean is always going to be zero on the standard score. And then that's seven. If it's one standard deviation away, it's just going to be one instead of seven because it, it went over two, but two is so standard deviation is equal to two. So one standard deviation over, you add two, but one standard deviation here on this because standard deviation is one, it's just going to be one. So that's standardizing it. So five was standardized to zero, and then seven was standardized to one. So that's just a way to look at it. Um, so, and the empirical rule applies that same idea. Um, all the empirical rule is just showing you is basically um, the percent of the data that lies, um, you know, at these different points. So we have our mean of plus or minus one, that's 68% of our data. So that's saying that underneath this curve, this is 68% of all the data we have if we were to display our data. Um, and then same thing goes for, you know, plus or minus two, that's where we usually use our um, 95% confidence interval, if you guys remember, that's where um, we often have that because it's between plus or minus two standard deviations. And that would be if we were to standardize it, you know, we would find out that that's it. So remember for the empirical role, we are working off of a graph that has standard deviation of one and a mean of zero, which as you can see here, that's what we're getting. So yeah, that's the empirical rule. I love it. I think it's fun. Um, so correlation, correlation is similar um, to the things that we see on, um, on scatter plots. Um, so it's a single number that's talking about basically the strength and direction of um, two different variables. So these are going to be um, quantitative and correlation of zero means that there's no relationship whatsoever. Correlation of one or negative one indicates a perfect relationship, but it's either a perfect positive um, or perfect negative relationship. So correlation of one positively, oh, now you can't see that, um, is going to be like that, um, like a straight line, and then negatively it's going to be like that because it wants to be from left to right. So that's what correlation is. Um, and yeah, we represent it by the letter R, obviously. So, okay, so then we have correlation and regression issues. So we have our extrapolation, which is basically if you do correlation and then you accidentally, or not accidentally, Hopefully this is an accent, but if you're using correlation and you're going outside of your data set that you have and then trying to make conclusions on things that you don't have, you're just kind of looking at the trend and, you know, assuming it's going to continue. Um, that's not always true, as we know, so um, you don't want to extrapolate. That's not good. Um, and then also keep in mind that correlation does not equal causation. Um, so if two things are correlated with one another, that doesn't mean that one causes the other. So do keep that in mind. Um, and then also logically interpreting your y-intercept, that's basically saying that just because your graph has a y-intercept on it doesn't mean that that's something significant in terms of the context of the problem. That's why at the end of the day, we always want to kind of, like we do in hypothesis tests, like make a conclusion based upon the real world data and the context of the problem that's important so that we can, um, you know, actually make it make sense because, you know, numbers are good and all, but we want to make sure it's relevant to what we're trying to learn there. All right, so let's try this question. So true or false, for all the books in the Library of Congress, the correlation between the thickness of books and in inches and their number of page pages would be positive. So think about this one, and then let me know what you think the answer is.
Good job. Yes, our answer here is definitely going to be true um, because this is basically saying that as the um, number of pages goes up, um, then also the thickness is going to go up. So this makes sense because obviously if you have more pages, it's going to be thicker. So that's going to be an increase in the inches. So our answer here is going to be true. So good job. All righty. So risk and odds. So getting a little bit into probability, which is everyone's favorite, including myself. Um, so risk and odds. So they both, once again, are describing the likelihood of an event. Um, that's what gets people confused because they are very similar, but we have to understand that they are there are different interpretations of them. So um, the risk is going to be the probability that an event will occur in general. It's really the same thing as the probability. So the probability that something's happening. And then odds are going to be the likelihood of an event um, happening versus not happening, which is why that um, denominator is going to be the number without the outcome there. Um, so that's where we get odds from. And then um, the same, the number without the outcome is the same thing as one minus risk. So that is why we have um, odds down there as that um, value. So keep that in mind. Um, okay. So then we have, um, this is just talking about a little bit more into risk between groups and situations. So like I said, risk is our general, um, just, you know, probability that something's going to happen, but relative risk is comparing groups then. Um, so one, it's the risk of one group divided by the risk of the other group. So, and the way you interpret that is you're saying group one is this many times more likely to experience the event than group two is. Um, so that's just the relative risk. And then increased risk is um, your, all it is is your relative risk. So the risk of one group divided by the other uh, minus one. So that's basically saying that how, you know, so maybe you find the um, how many times more likely um, this group is than the other group to experience it. Um, but then the increased risk is saying like how many times like higher is it? So it's a little bit more specific there. Uh, so let's try this one. So true or false, when you flip a thumbtack into the air, can land point up or point down? Since there are just two possibilities, the chance of each one must be 50%. So let me know what you think the answer for this is. All right, cool. So this is, yep, good job. So our answer here is gonna be false. Um, we do wanna keep in mind that when, just because there's two options doesn't mean it's gonna be 50-50. Um, there's other variables that are kept in mind here. Um, so for example, a thumbtack obviously, you know, looks something, that looks like a volcano. Pew, pew. All right, just kidding. Um, so, <laughs> so, so close, right? They a little boop. Now it looks like a volcano on a stick. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is just the, I, <laughs> I just, this is good. This is the end of the semester. Um, th it looks like, you know, there's obviously probably more chance it's gonna land on this side because it's heavier, you know, it's weighted differently. So that's why, you know, it's not a 50-50 chance for that thumbtack, unless you get like a thumbtack that looks like a cylinder. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, let's clear this and move on. All right, boop. So, expected value. Um, I know <laughs> it has been, it really has been. I know, and then I'll do stat 200 after this and just keep talking about stat, I love it. <laughs> so, um, expected value, that's our long run average. So that's gonna be um, basically, if we were to do the study that we're doing over and over and over again, if you had that much time and you were that interested in it, um, uh, this is basically predicting what would happen. So all you do is your sum of your values times the probability, which makes sense um, because it's basically saying that you have the probability of getting that value um, every single time. So if you were to multiply those, that's kind of like what you would expect to get if you did it over and over and over again. And then, you know, adding them up obviously for that. So, okay, and then our law, law of large numbers. This is saying, uh, we talked about this last week or two weeks ago. Um, so it's saying that our averages or proportions are going to be more stable when we have more trials. So we have to keep in mind um, that this doesn't happen by like 
if you have a bunch of trials, it doesn't mean that like you had um, a run of bad luck um, going on or something because you, since they're independent from, from one another, that, that means like there's not going to be any sort of overlap or there aren't going to be um, pieces that, you know, kind of impact one another. Um, so they are going to be more stable if there's more trials and everything. Um, and we can conclude that it's not just because there was like bad luck and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of good luck. So it evened out. Um, Cause yeah, there's no memory in the trials there. Okay, and then talking about normal approximation. Um, so we talked about a little bit in terms of, you know, how we describe the shape of um, different distributions. Normal approximation means, you know, once again, that it approximate, approximates a normal distribution, which looks something like this. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a nice normal curve. So remember, our mean is equal to our median, which is equal to our mode, if it's symmetrical. Um, Normal approximation is not always symmetrical, but same idea. Um, it's basically saying that it's approximately symmetrical. That's why it's called an approximation. Um, and then this is just showing you the standard deviation of a sample mean and a sample proportion. Um, another way to write this one um, is if we ended up doing, so our standard deviation of a sample mean, we're basically saying that we're assuming that it's about the same as you know our population one. So we're saying that, because um, technically, this is what we're gonna use is our sample standard deviation divided by square root of our sample size. And then for this one, technically what we're gonna use is our, um, our sample proportion times one minus our sample proportion divided by our sample size. But it's basically saying that if it's normally approximated, we can assume that the sample proportion or the sample mean is gonna be um, approximating that population, which is why we can use those equations there. So that's basically what that's getting at. Okay, so confidence intervals. Love. So basically what we want to do, these are just the four different um, the four different parts of a confidence interval um, equation or procedure. That's it. Um, so, okay, step one is going to be basically you're trying to figure out what's the parameter of the statistic. You know, what, what are we trying to figure out here? Um, what's the remember parameter goes along with the population. Statistic goes along with um, the sample. And then step two, you want to see if it's normal approxi normally approximated. Um, which those two checks there, see if it's a random sample or if the trials are independent and if you have a large enough sample size like we've been talking about forever. Um, and as long as it is, then you can move on to step three, then um, estimate that sam uh, standard deviation of the statistic, which is using these. Um, and we call them the standard error. That's another way to write it because it's the standard deviation of the statistic. Um, but still using that population um, standard de deviation equation because we're assuming that it represents that because it's um, normally approximated. And then you go ahead through and find the statistic plus or minus the z, um, z star to do your confidence interval um, and then times your standard error. Um, so yeah, that's how you do your confidence interval. Um, so this is kind of a conceptual question here. So true or false, everything else being equal, a confidence interval for an average will be shorter if the sample size is much larger. So go ahead and let me know what you think, if it's true or false, and then we will go over this together. Okay, good. Yeah, so our answer is going to be true. Confident. Don't need a question mark. We want true. Raise the roof. So remember when we, thank you, Alex. Um, remember when we have our sample size, okay, we always want to have a large sample size. That's just like the way to go. This is just, yes, we love that. But um, we want to keep in mind too that we want our confidence interval to be small because we want to be confident that what we're looking for is in this area, you know? So, so if I'm trying to decide, you know, like on my street, I'm playing hide and seek. I just thought of this right now. This is going to be, actually, this is either going to make zero sense or make a lot of sense, but we'll see. So if I'm on my street, 
I'm playing hide and seek. Okay. And I'm trying to figure out where the person that I'm seeking is at. I want, and I want to make a 95% confidence interval of where I think they are. I want that to be small. So I don't have to look all up and down the street. I want it to be small. So I would want to have a large sample size in order to make a smaller, um, like I want to have a, a large sample size of people who told me where they might be because that'll give me more and more information so that I can be more confident that it's in a smaller area. If I only got information from one person who was just kind of strolling around, I'm going to have to basically say like, no, I need this entire street. So that's the point being is that um, an increase in our sample size gives us an, um, a decrease in the width. Um, so that means, you know, I guess I'd say more narrow, more narrow or shorter, whatever. Um, so that is where we get that from. So yeah, our answer, what's our answer? True. <laughs> ah, okay, cool. Yes, answer is true. Bless up. All right, does that make sense? Any questions? I don't know if that, that was a weird, oh, cool, bless. I don't know if that was a weird um, thing, example to use. I don't know why I said that. I need some more coffee. Okay, let's see. Oh, we're almost done. Don't cry. Don't cry, everyone. It's okay. Um, okay, so a random sample of 100 college students found that they got an average of six hours of sleep the night before their last midterm. Yikes. With a standard deviation of two hours, this says that a 95% confidence interval for average hours of sleep for all students before midterm is what? So let me know what you guys think the answer to this one is, and then we will go over it together. Yes, good job. Answer is B, happy. Okay, I need to stop. All right, B, amazing. So if we think about this, so we found an average of six hours of sleep. So that's going to be, um, if we were to write this out in terms of our normal equation, we have our X bar plus or minus, and then um, our whatever the standard, or well, our Z star, and then times our standard error, also known as our standard deviation. Um, so if we were to plug all these in, we have the six hours, which is our sample um, or point estimate, plus or minus our Z star, and since it's a 95% confidence interval, that's going to be two. And then um, our standard deviation, we want to go ahead and do um, of two hours, so that's going to be another two here. And then we're going to do, so then six plus or minus four is going to end up being the answer for B. So, um, Yep, that's basically how we find it. Does that make sense how we got the answer of B there? Cool. Amazing. Good job. All right. Only a few more things to talk about. Um, so hypothesis testing, we have the same steps here. So not the same steps, but we have steps as well. So step one, we want, want to do the same thing and asking what's our parameter of interest. Are we talking about means, proportions? Uh, we did talk about how we have like difference in means, um, difference of proportions, that kind of thing. And then you want to write that null and alternative hypothesis um, in terms of that parameter. So remember our null and alternative, our null is going to be something like this. We're always going to have P equals something um, if, it's, if it's a one sample or you're going to have mu equals something because um, it's always going to have an equal sign. And then our alternative hypothesis, you're going to have P is either greater than or less than 
or not equal to, and then same thing with mu. Um, so remember, we always are gonna use either P or mu because we're talking about the parameter, and these are the, um, the different symbols you use for parameters. So keep that in mind, don't let that trip you up. You're never gonna see something like, oh, your null hypothesis is um, P hat equals eight. Like, no, you don't use P hat, no, no, no. I always wanna use P or mu. So P, obviously, if you're talking about proportions, mu is for means. Um, and then step two, you wanna figure out um, what is the sample statistic and its distribution if the null hypothesis is true. We are always gonna assume that the null is true. Um, and then if it's normally distributed, um, given that you're gonna calculate that standard score there. So your standard score is going to be um, R Z star um, in order, or T Z for proportions, T for means. And then step three, um, so how likely is it happen? And then you find, you use the tables that you're given to find your p-value and then based upon that p-value, what are you gonna conclude? Um, so reject, fail to reject, that kind of thing. So these are the different steps you use here. Remember, the biggest thing, don't ever let it trip you up that you always, if you're writing a hypothesis, you are always gonna use either p or mu, nothing else. Don't ever use p hat or x bar when you're writing hypotheses. That's the biggest mistake I see that is made there. All right, let's do one last question here. So true or false, a p-value is the probability that the null hypothesis is correct. So let me know if you think that's true or false. Yes, the confidence, good job. Yeah, sorry, we, this is gonna be false. Um, our p-value is always, yes, good. Yep, so our p-value, if, um, if we remember, if we have a, like a hypothesis test and whatever, so we have like our mean going on over here and then we get um, our value. So let's say that this is like our x bar. this is our value that we got. Um, and let's say it was a right tail test. So it's saying that like um, mu is greater than this value. Um, we would shade in this part, and then that shaded area is gonna be the p-value. So that's the probability of um, us getting this value or one more extreme than that in terms of um, our alternative hypothesis and what direction it was in. So this is gonna be a right-tailed test um, because it is greater than. Um, so that's why, um, yeah, so that's our rejection range. So you are correct on that one. So, um, so yeah, and we always wanna make sure that we're always gonna assume that the null is true. Um, which is why we're basically assuming that there's no change because that's what our null is saying, that there's no change whatsoever. Alternative is saying that there is a change. So the hypothesis, that's the point of it, is to try to prove that there's some sort of change going on. So you're trying to prove that null hypothesis to be um, wrong. So I think of the null hypothesis as your mom, you know? It's like you, your mom's always right. So if you're trying to prove her wrong, you're your alternative hypothesis. So that's how you get all that. So that's what you do with the null hypothesis. Okay, so good job, answer's false. All right, wow, we just went through the whole semester crying, so sad. Um, so, I just messed up the screen, as always. Okay, so um, you can obviously check out recordings for these um, on um, YouTube, and then if you haven't, I think everyone gave me their Penn State email, so thank you for that. And yes, I can do that. It's also on the review session central page where you found the, probably the link to my Zoom room. Um, there's stuff on there. And then, so if you have any last minute questions, please feel free to let me know. If not, I hope you guys um, have fun on the final. Just kidding, I hate when professors say that. <laughs> I hope you guys um, do well on the final, I know you will. Um, and thanks for coming by this semester.